pace-setting leadership. And it's going to be a good time in the Lord tonight. Amen? Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, do I have my mic yet? <laughs> Thank you so much. I had the TBN mic there for a minute. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, let's go ahead and start. Let's just go ahead and start in somewhere. Um, just go to 17. Let's just, just let's read for a while. I'm 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. Thank God the word of God will bring us out of blindness and into the light. Amen. Amen. Who being fat, past feelings have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. That you put on concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitfulness, excuse me, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know, Jesus in your life makes a big difference. It ought to be just the difference between day and night, between life and death, when Christ comes on the inside. Amen? Amen. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. But we have to put him on. Boy, he got dead in here all of a sudden. <laughs> Put him on. <laughs> Put on the new man. You know, some people say, "Just listen, I just want to be real. I just want to be real. I ain't going to be putting on. If I'm mad, everybody's going to know I'm mad. If I'm, if I'm sad, everybody's going to know I'm sad. I ain't going to be putting on. Well, let's just put on the new man. Nope, not me. I'm just, I'm just going to be real. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be real carnal. That's the truth. So we need to recognize who we are in Christ Jesus and put it, put it on daily. Start seeing yourself like he's described you. Amen? Amen. See the, get a brand new image of yourself and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. We should read that about 50 times. <laughs> Don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to the devil. Don't give place to... <laughs> I've been hanging around Amanda too long, I'll tell you. <laughs> Let's go. Will you stay with me tonight? Let's have a word of prayer together. And don't forget. Don't give place to the devil. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in this place tonight. You are an awesome God. And this salvation you have for us is absolutely amazing. Nothing like it. Thank you, Jesus. We're here to just uplift and glorify and magnify you tonight, Lord. And what you have for us is just such a trillion times greater that our minds can conceive. We just thank you for the privilege to have an audience with heaven tonight and worship you. Then get around that word and let that word wash and renew our mind and conform us to the image of Christ to bring you glory and honor with our life. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's go ahead and worship him together.
sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my in my life that uh, there are certain things that happened to me as a young man in the foundations and the basics of my walk with the Lord and I've never been able to get away from those not that I want to I'm just saying they're vital to me every day those basics are vital just surrendering to Christ receiving his shed blood for the cleansing of my sin for the basis of fellowship with him giving him all the honor and all the glory and all the praise for every good thing that he does. Endeavoring to be led by the Spirit, to wash and renew my mind and allow it to be conformed to the image of Christ. Make Jesus the Lord of my life. The foundation that we started with, we can never, we don't ever want to get away from that. Appreciate that every day. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you're so good to me. You've been so good to me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you've been good to me. You've been so good to me, Lord. 
Say that with me. Lord, you've been good to me. You've been so good to me, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We worship you today. We magnify you, Lord.
what specifically this is for, but the Lord just put this verse so heavy on my heart. I just, I'm just going to read it. This comes from Mark chapter 4, and I'm going to start at verse 13. He said, Do you not understand all parables? How then will you understand? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear it, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear it, the word immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so they endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, this is the part that he really is putting on me. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. The desires of your heart can literally stop the word from working in your life. And I don't know what's going on right now, but I have never experienced a greater wave of distraction from the word. I've never experienced in my own life the devil trying to get me going in every different direction. And he's pulling me. And what it's doing is it's trying to skew my vision. And I have to just back up and say, wait a minute. God sits on the throne of my heart. Nothing else sits in the middle of my heart. Not my desires, not the things that I'm going through, not the struggles in my life, not just everyday life things that I'm going through, the motions. I'm not just going to come to church and just go through the motions. The Lord sits in the middle of my heart. And devil, I will not be distracted. And you will not stop me. See, sometimes we got to back up. And there are things that are taking root in us that the devil is trying to pull us away. He's trying to stop us from constantly seeking closer to the heart of God. If you've lost your hunger, sometimes you need to step back and say, what is pulling my appetite? What is it in my life that I need to cut off at the root? Because God sits on the center of my heart. And tonight I'm going to enter into worship and I'm going to take a step back from everything I life. And Father God, right now, I place you back on the top of the wheel. I push you back on that throne. And I throw everything else aside. I throw away the cares. I throw away the worries. I do throw away the distractions, the deceitfulness of riches. I don't care what's going on at work. I don't care what's going on in my family. I don't care tonight, Lord. It's you and me. It's you and me. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. He's my Lord. He's my soon coming King. Let me, let me just talk about that same verse for a minute. <laughs> the sower sows the word. Do you know the word of God covers everything pertaining to life and godliness? You know there are words that you can sow from God's words that are healing words? That are words, there are words that are prosperity words. There are, there are wisdom seeds that you can sow into your life from His Word. There's provision. There's anointing. Everything you'll ever need comes from His Word. Let me say it again. Everything you'll ever need comes from His Word. It is provided by His Word. His Word is everything to us. Everything. Everything. So once you sow the seed of the Word, our entire life should be wrapped up in sowing the seed of God's Word in our life and finding over 7,000 covenant promises that He wants for us to walk in and enjoy. So our entire life should be wrapped up in focusing on sowing the seed of the Word of God in our life. And if you'll do that, 
and, and, and you, like Sunday we talked about, the Word of God conceived in the human spirit. Formed by the tongue, spoken out your mouth, becomes creative power that will work for you. If you will allow the Word of God to be planted on the inside of you, and you conceive that on the inside, then you water that. When you, when you go, to head, go ahead and give birth to that Word, the anointing of God is released, the power of God, the authority of God is released, and that promise is accomplished in your life. Here's my whole point. Do you ever see an apple tree? You're out there in the field and you look at the apple tree and all of a sudden the apple just goes, huh! apple. <laughs> Want to see it again? <laughs> apple. <laughs> Do you know the apple tree doesn't struggle? It's a very natural process. So many times we're just struggling, boy. Everything you're just very, and we're str and we ain't supposed to be struggling. You sow the seed of the word, you water that seed with a confession of your mouth, and after a little while, you get the fruit, and the fruit is wonderful. So your life shouldn't be a struggle. It ought to be such a, your success, your victory, your authority, it, it ought to be so natural. And, and you're not looking, you're not focused on those things. You're just focused on the Word. And, and the natural by, byproduct of the Word is healing. The natural byproduct of the Word is security. The natural byproduct of the Word is a sound mind. Hey, man. So then, then people come and they go, well, how did you get this? And you show them the Word, and you allow them to sow that seed in their life. The sower sows the Word. Our whole life should be wrapped up in sowing the seed, keeping Jesus on the throne. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Apple. <laughs> oh, uh. Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you, Lord, tonight for the privilege to gather around your word. And we just bless this time together in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated. One, two. How's everybody doing? Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, we're going to have a good night tonight, amen? How many guys have read ahead and read the lesson? Nobody? Sweet. <laughs> Nobody's read the lesson, huh? All right. Yours is done? Beverly gets an A-plus for tonight. Her lesson is done. Give Beverly a hand clap. She did her lesson. She did it all today. She crammed up to eight. Wow, you are way ahead of me, Beverly. Wow, that's awesome. Teacher's pet. Well, tonight we are on session five, for those of you who uh, need to know where we're going here. We're on session five, and this is called Proper Attitudes for Leadership. Everybody go, ooh, ooh. And so all day I've been thinking, am I in the mood to change your tude? <laughs> Ask yourself this question, are you in the mood to change your tude? Are you? Amen. So we're going to talk about Putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And we're going to talk about renewing your mind. How many of you guys could use some of that tonight? Amen. If you have your Bibles, could you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. And let's just read this real quick. 
1 Corinthians chapter 2. How many of you guys are enjoying this class so far? You know, Pastor Dave is a brilliant man to write this book. I've been reading through this book, and I just thought, wow, this guy is amazing. The Lord has really gifted him. Amen. First, First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says this. Who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Everybody say, I have the mind of Christ. I have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? That means you can think God's thoughts. Most people do not know that. I have the mind of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you do have the mind. It means you can have the mind of Christ, right? And we're going to talk about how do we get the mind of Christ tonight? We have to get in there and study his word, amen? We're going to talk about that. So Pastor Dave starts out with this. I'm just going to read a little bit of this because it's so good. And we're on chapter 12 if you have your book. You can follow along with me a little bit. And it says, Business philosopher and radio personality Earl Nightingale called attitude the magic word. The late Zig Ziglar, motivational speaker and sales genius, said, It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. Let me say that again. It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. So all this has to do with your attitude and how you perceive things. If you have a rotten attitude about your life, you're going to have a hard time going anywhere with God. It's just the truth of it. If you're mad and upset all the time, you're going to have a hard time going anywhere with people, too. Because nobody likes to hang around somebody who has a rotten attitude. Isn't that the truth? How many of you guys have ever been around somebody that every time you go around them, they're just flat, ornery, and they're touchy, and they're picky, and you get around them, and you're like, okay, I'm going to walk on glass. I'm going to walk on eggshells every time you get around them. What's the first thing you want to do when you get around them? You want to get away from them. Because everything they say is, eh, to me. I just, back off. You're have, he's having one bad day. Have you ever said that to somebody? Ooh, somebody's had a bad day. <laughs> it's the truth. Attitude is everything with God. Attitude and heart. Attitude and heart. Rick Joyner's book. Um, how many of you guys have ever heard of Rick Joyner? I have a bunch of his books. That guy is amazing. If you haven't read any of Rick Joyner's books. He has a couple books you need to read. Write this down if you haven't read them. The Final Quest. How many of you guys have ever read that one? That thing is amazing. The Final Quest. It's all about a vision that he had. The Call is amazing. Um, Epic Battles is another one. And then he has another one about a sword. I can't remember the name of it right now. And you can get on YouTube and listen to the books. And they're amazing. That was a side note for you. A tidbit for you. But he had... Um, He wrote a book, and in this particular book, I don't know exactly which one it is. I think it's the final quest. He had a dream about three armies, three specific armies. And Pastor Dave tells about this in this book. And uh, in the first first army, he said he saw thousands of soldiers, just huge amounts of soldiers. And it had the greatest number of soldiers of all three of the armies. But everywhere that group of soldiers went, thousands of soldiers, the grass, everywhere they went, turned brown. The trees turned brown, and everything died. So this is a vision that he's having. And he said, man, what in the world is going on with that? Well, then he had a vision of the second army. There was another army. And this army was mid-sized, wasn't as big as the first army. And everywhere they went, sometimes the grass turned green, and sometimes the grass turned brown, and they were middle-sized. Weird, huh? Well, then he said, I'm I'm just kind of puzzled, and I'm asking the Lord, what in the world is going on? He said, then I had vision of the third army. 
And that was the smallest army of all. And he said, but everywhere this army went, the grass turned green with new growth. And everywhere they went, trees were formed and plants were forming. You know what green means in the dream book, Pastor Dave's dream book? It means new growth. That's what green means. And he said, everywhere this army went, everything grew. And he said the Lord was revealing to him that words were what were turning the grass brown or green. So the first army came out, and they were spouting junk words. They were envious. They had bitterness. They had rotten attitudes, and the grass would turn brown and die. And everywhere they went, the trees would turn brown and die. The second group were 50-50. Half the time they were spouting the word of God, and half the time the grass would die, which means they were double-minded. So one minute, yes, I, got, I have the mind of Christ. I can do all things. The next second, oh, my gosh, I'm going to die. I don't know what's going on with me. I feel sick to my stomach. He's a jerk, God. It's, it's true. They're double-minded. So, so half the time, the grass would die, and half the time, the grass was green. How many of you guys know you're never going to get anywhere with that? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That's what the Bible says. You cannot be double-minded and go anywhere with God. I was driving down the road, this was just a couple months ago, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke up on the inside of me, and he said, Laura, are you all in? I just, I'm just driving down the road. I was right by Veneta's. I remember it perfectly. I'm driving down the road. Laura, are you all in with me? And I thought, well, yeah, God, I'm all in with you. And I thought, did I just dream that up, or did the Spirit of the Lord say that to me? Well, about two hours later, I was flipping through Facebook, Lana Vosser had got on there, and she said, the Spirit of the Lord says, are you all in? I was like, oh, I did hear him. You know what he told me? Can't be double-minded. If you're going to go with me, go with me all the way. Don't, don't have, uh, come on, God, I can do this, and then a, I can't attitude and speak doubt and unbelief. Because if you 50-50, you're not going to get anything with God. It's all or nothing with God. How many of you guys know that? Amen. So the third army, let's go to the third army. <clears throat> the third army was the smallest of all, and everywhere they went, the grass turned green. That means that army was the remnant of God, and they were all in with God, and everywhere they went, growth, anointing. They flourished. They had the favor of God. They had the blessing of God. They had the right mindset and the right attitude. That's the vision that Rick Joyner had. That's a pretty cool vision, isn't it? Zig Ziglar said this. Oh, we just said that, but I'll repeat it. It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that will determine your altitude. So what is your attitude? The definition of your attitude is this. Attitude is a way of behaving that reflects what you think or feel. Some people are good at hiding what they think or feel, and some people, you can see it on them when, they're, when they walk in. How <laughs> many you guys know I'm telling the truth? Uh, you can read them like a book when they walk in. Uh-oh, we got trouble. But some people can hide that. Amen? But see, with God, you can't hide. God sees the heart. And so you might think you're hiding your rotten attitude from everybody, and you may be. But you will never hide your rotten attitude from the Lord. Which wrong attitude pr produces wrong motives. That's just, that's just a fact. If you have the wrong attitude, you're going to have a wrong motive, and you're not going to do that as unto the Lord. And as a result, you will not have the blessing of the Lord. I'll give you an illustration of this. Dad uses this all the time, and I never forgot this illustration. How many, go, how many guys love Pastor Dave's illustration? Because I do. I remember him. So, how many guys think Pastor Dave's the best preacher on the planet? I think he is too. So, anyway, Kenneth Hagin said this. You ready? He said he was, he was, when he was younger, he was preaching. If I forget a detail, you can remind me. When he was younger, he was preaching, and uh, he said he was just about to starve to death. He had a bunch of kids. 
And he was driving around, his tires were bald. He said, you know, he had holes in his shoes. You guys know this illustration. And he said, I was just about to starve to death. I didn't have enough gas to get from one place to another. And he said, I went to the Lord and said, God, what is going on? And the Lord said, what are you doing? Basically, he said the Lord gave him a verse. Isaiah 1, 19. Write this down. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Kenneth Hagin said, God, I'm doing everything you asked me to do. Man, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm preaching, and I'm starving to death. And the Lord gave him the verse again. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Right? So he goes back to God. God, I'm doing the verse. He said, you're not doing it. He said, God, what am I doing? He said, you're obedient, but you're not willing. So what does that mean? That means he didn't have the right attitude. He had the wrong attitude, and he was trudging around, doing what God told him to do, not wanting to do it, and, and he was starving to death, and the Lord saw his heart. The Lord sees your heart with your attitude. So he said, okay, God, I change my attitude right now. I am willing. What do you want me to do? And he said, from that minute, the blessing came on him. And the Lord blessed him, and he had everything he needed. The Lord provided everything he needed. That's how important attitude is with God. Your attitude is a big deal. If you are unwilling with the Lord, you're in trouble. If he asks you to do something, and you do it begrudgingly, big trouble. Amen? Your motive affects your attitude, and your attitude affects your motive. It works both ways. Amen? Let's keep going. Let's talk about developing the mind of Christ. So, let's run through. Wait a minute. Let me back up here. Ask yourself, is your attitude producing good fruit in your life? I had to ask myself that the other day. Is my attitude, do I have the right attitude about things? Is your attitude reflective of the mind of Christ? I had, to, I had to be honest. I had to change a few things the other day. I thought, you know what? The mind of Christ would not have that attitude and think those thoughts about this person or that person. Isn't that the truth? So let's run through the attitude checklist. Are you guys ready for this? This is going to be fun, guys. I'm telling you. Have you ever said or thought any of the following? Number one, some people get all the breaks in life. Have you guys ever thought that? God, you know, so-and-so is over here. He has done nothing for you. I'm over here busting my can, working for you. I clean your church. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm serving on the teams out there. I'm shaking everybody's hand, trying to pray for everybody. And he got all of that, and I got nothing. How many of you guys have ever thought that before? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Uh, yeah, is your attitude producing what you want to in life? Some people get all the breaks, God. Why not me? What about me? Did you forget me? How many of you guys have ever thought that? Wrong attitude. God is always fair. God never forgets you. God is, he'll never forget your work and labor of love. The Bible says that. You can't even give a cup of cold water where God doesn't reward you for it. So you just have to know right now, God's always fair. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's always fair. He's not unjust. Amen. <clears throat> all right, some people get all the breaks in life. How about this? Other people get the promises of God to work, and I can't. How about that? That kind of goes along with the first one. Other people get the promises of God to work. So they believe God, and God just gives them, it just seems like it's effortless, God. And here I am, believing you. I'm believing you, Jesus. Here, I believe in God. Everybody come over. How you doing? Shut up. I believe in God. Leave me alone. It's true. We do that sometimes. <laughs> oh, my word. I gotta... Other people get the promises of God to work, and I can't. Wrong attitude. The promises of God are for everyone. So if they're not working for you, you need to stop, calm down, back up, and figure out 
where your trouble spot is. And once you fix that trouble spot, you're going to be fine. And listen, I've asked the Holy Ghost, I know it's not you. It's got to be me. God, I need you to show me where I'm missing it. Where am I missing this? Open my eyes so I can see where I'm missing it, because I know it's me. Listen, it's always you. Just get used to it. It's not going to be, God didn't say, look down and say, ooh, I made a mistake there. I'm really sorry. I'll fix that. God doesn't do that. It's always you. Just saying. End of story, right? How about this one? It's flu season, and I'm probably going to get sick. I have heard this one a lot. Well, you know, flu's coming around, probably going to hit me. I'm just preparing. I went to the store and bought all my medicine. I'm just, I'm just getting ready for it. You know what you just did? You just acted in faith that you were going to get sick. <laughs> and I bet you $100 it will work because you believe it. Amen? Wrong attitude. How about this one? Oh, this is, this is a funny one. All my problems are my wife's or husband's fault. <laughs> I am never wrong. How many of you guys think that? The husband's never wrong. The wife's never wrong. Well, I'll tell you whose fault it is. It's so-and-so's fault. They always want to blame somebody else. If they wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have done this. Wrong attitude. we got to take a little responsibility, right? We'll move along off of that one. Okay. <laughs> How about this one? If I had a better boss, I'd be a better worker. <laughs> no, I tell you, that boss of mine, he's working my fingers to the bone, God. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever thought that before? God, if you could just give me somebody else, anybody but him, God, a better boss. How many of you guys have ever thought that? Wrong attitude. That's, your, that's a wrong attitude. Here's another one. That's the way the ball bounces. Whatever will be, will be. You know, I have said that one. Well, it is what it is. It will be what it will be. No, it won't. I have the power to change that. Amen? What I say, it, it will happen if I believe it. So what I have to do is prophesy my future. But what people do is prophesy what they have instead. They don't prophesy what they believe they, that the Lord wants them to have. They prophesy just what I have. Amen? You have to prophesy your future. Wrong attitudes. And the last one is, if you're a success, you must be doing something illegal or unethical. That guy's making way too much money and driving a really nice car. So he must be doing something on the side that's not great. He's dealing something over there. I'm just saying, just saying. Wrong attitude. Why can't you walk in the blessing of the Lord? You can. Why can't you walk in the favor of the Lord? You can. Isn't that the truth? Amen. Let's keep going because we're running out of time here. <clears throat> Oh, my word, we are running out of time, and I haven't even started. Oh. <clears throat> you know, I would say I'm a chip off the old block. <laughs> so, a lot of us have the mindset of I can't. So when you're born again, your spirit man on the inside of you is born again, but your mind and your body are not. Pastor Dave talks about this. So let's say somebody weighs, you know, 400 pounds. Then they get saved. After they get saved, they still weigh 400 pounds, right? So your mind does not get saved when you get saved, and your body doesn't get saved. Your spirit man gets saved. So when your spirit man gets saved, you have to start to work on your body and start to work on reprogramming your mind. And that takes work to reprogram your mind. Okay. When the children of Israel left, they had all the gold and riches of Egypt. And he talks about this in here. Um, but they ended up losing it on the way to the promised land. So when they left Egypt, the Lord said, take everything. They had a slave mentality. They had been slaves for 400 years. They were completely programmed to be a slave. 
That was their mentality. And when they left Egypt, it took a while for them to reprogram their mind. Isn't that the truth? They had the wrong mindset and they had the wrong thinking. Slave mentality. Many of us in our lives have patterns <clears throat> and habits we struggle to break because of our programming in our mind. Let's just take, for example, what you eat. A couple years ago, I ate a lot of sugar, and I got addicted to sugar. It was just programmed into me. It was a normal part of my daily life. And then the Lord, you know, I was, I was having issues here, and I was trying to fix myself, and I thought that God, that God told me, hey, hey, back off that sugar. That is hard to reprogram your brain that it doesn't need sugar. How many of you guys have ever tried it? Your brain and your body scream, give me sugar, and I want it now. And I don't mean maybe, right? Matter of fact, if you don't give it to me, I'm going to make you ornery. I'm going to make, your body talks to you. What do you have to do to that, to your body? You have to discipline your body. Same way goes with your mind. You have to discipline your mind. How do you do that? You got to open up the Word of God and start quoting that scripture. I have the mind of Christ. Here was my verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I will beat this addiction. Whatever your addiction is. Mine was sugar. And it took a while to beat it, but I was reprogramming my body. I was reprogramming my brain. I, I had to stop that. Amen. <clears throat> let's, let's keep going here. <clears throat> People with the wrong attitude take everything in a negative way. You pay them a compliment and they say, what did you mean by that? How many of you guys have ever met somebody that way? People with the wrong attitude think in extremes. He loves me. No, he hates me. They have zero balance. They jump to conclusions and misinterpret interpret people's words. How many of you guys know anybody like that? Don't raise your hands. People with a wrong attitude act upon their own senses other than God's word. They believe what they see, feel, or hear, not what is true from God's perspective. So let's go to your little fill-in page here. And the first blank is this. The Israelites still had a slave mentality. The second blank would be, without dealing ruthlessly with the attitudes and the spirit of the mind, any changes will, will be only temporary. Our outer kingdom is a reflection of our inner kingdom. Let's keep going. Ephesians 4.23 says this, And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind. We're just talking about this. Ephesians 4.23. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Would you think that that would be a daily thing? I think sometimes it's more than a daily thing because there's sometimes in a day when I have to go home three or four times a day and give myself an attitude check with the Lord. It's true. There are some days I wake up, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm just ornery. And I, <laughs> and I wake up and, I, and I'll hear the Lord say, you're grumpy today. I can hear the Holy Ghost tell me that. And I think, yeah, I am. And I'll go home and spend some time with the Holy Ghost until I get over it. And sometimes you have to do that a couple times a day. Get away from people and go home and straighten yourself out. Give yourself an attitude adjustment. How many of you guys have ever done that? I've done that. Amen. <clears throat> the leader's renewed mind. Let's talk about this. As a Christian, you actually have the mind of Christ, which produces the attitude of a pace-setting leader. But some people persist in thinking, thinking only from a human point of view. They don't listen to Christ's thoughts or develop doing things his way in their lives. They aren't able to cast down imaginations. So what they're doing is they let their mind run rampant. 
They have no self-control, and I can tell you why. They don't get, get in there and spend time with God. There's no time spent with the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> they, they are not able to cast down imaginations that exalt themselves against the mind of Christ. These people never become pace-setting leaders because they don't develop the right attitude. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the most important lessons in this session is the right attitude for a leader. Because if you have the wrong attitudes and you're dealing with people, you can ruin relationships and you can ruin that and you're responsible before the Lord for that. Amen. True leaders have the mind of Christ and as a result, everything around them grows and improves just like the army. Everything around them will grow and improve if you have the right attitude. Author and pastor Rick Joyner has written a trilogy of books called The Final Quest, The Call, and Epic Battles, which we just talked about. <clears throat> I'm on page 104 if you guys are following along with me. It's because your attitude and mental patterns have been programmed into you, and it takes time to reprogram them. You were programmed, this, listen to this, this is good. You were programmed by your parents, by your peers, by your teachers, by your babysitters, the people you met who influenced you. Their thinking became your thinking, even if their thinking was wrong. Research shows that attitudes are pretty much developed by the age of 20. Did you guys know that? If you were born after age 20, you're going to have to work especially hard to kick out old ideas and habits. So after the age of 20, it gets a little bit more difficult. And I wanted to skip ahead to something right here. <clears throat> How about this? Identifiers of people with the wrong attitudes. Number one, people who magnify the negative. We talked about that. <clears throat> Number two, people who jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. Believing and acting on our senses rather than what God's word says. Did I lose you guys? I lost me too. Hang on a second. I have like four pages up here, so I'm trying to follow my notes, his notes, and the paper. Let's just start right here. Romans 12, 2 on this page, session 5. Let's go back a little bit. Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after and adapted to ex external superficial customs, but be transformed and changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideas and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Did you guys get that? Do not be conformed to this world. That means you cannot think like other people in the world think. When you get saved and the Spirit of the Lord comes on the inside of you, you have to think like God thinks. And if you want to be honest with yourself, I think most of us have to work on that. Because we go into a situation and we don't think like God thinks. We think like our flesh wants us to think. And that's where your emotions get you in trouble sometimes. And you know what your emotions are? They're indicators of what you need to work on most of the time. You get in there and a little bit of anger flares up. And you know what? Oh, I need to work on this. And you go in and pray in the Spirit. Or you get in there and a little bitterness flares up and emotion comes out. Or you can get in there and the love of God comes pouring out. Amen. It can work both ways. Isn't that right? Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the entire, entire renewal of your mind. And that is, comes only by doing one thing, and that's getting in the Word of God and going over those scriptures over and over and over and over and over and over. So you have three parts to yourself. You, are a, you have a spirit, you have a mind, which is the next blank, and a body. 
And if you flip over in your workbook, I think it shows you a picture of that. Doesn't it show a picture of that? Yeah. On the last page, you can't see it, but if you flip over on the last page, it will show you a picture of your body, your soul, and your spirit. And right in the middle of that is your heart. Your heart is the center of all that, which goes right back to God looks at the heart. Isn't that right? So, you're a spirit, you have a mind, you live in a body. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's keep moving on. I had a bug on me, apparently. I'm bugging him, is what I'm doing. <laughs> I was bugging him. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> Okay, so attitude versus aptitude. Does anybody know what the answer to that is? Say that again. That's right. 85% attitude, 15% aptitude. And the next blank would be this. Our attitudes will affect every area of our lives, including business and ministry. A proper attitude is crucial for success of a pace setting master level leader. Chuck Swindoll said this. This is just a side note. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you, re how you respond. So, um, Pastor Dave says this, in the business world, in the church world, he said they've done statistics. And f in, in the business and church world, 5%, only 5% out of 100 are super successful in the church world, only 5%. 15% are average. They're pretty successful at uh, you know, working in the church and doing what they're supposed to do, but 80% are mediocre to failing. 80% of the church is mediocre and failing. We have some work to do on our attitude, don't we? Churches are made to grow. It's okay to be small, but it's not okay to stay there. That's what Pastor Dave says. It's okay to start out broke, but it's not okay to stay broke. <laughs> How about this for a statistic? 5% of the churches have over 450 members, only 5%. 15% have 200 to 400 people. Is that amazing or what? So how can we develop attitudes for success? I am so glad you guys are asking me this question. <laughs> Before we answer that, let's go to the identifiers of wrong attitudes. Let's go to the next page because I'm running out of time. <clears throat> we went over this, but I never gave you the answers. So, identifiers of wrong attitudes is number one, magnifying the negative. So no matter what, no matter what you say, have you ever went over to somebody's house, and no matter what you say, they have something bad to say in response? You're like, okay, if I told you the sky was blue, would you have something good to say? Probably not. Those people have super bad attitudes. They'll never grow. Man, this, once I started looking at this and I started reading this, I thought, oh, my word, I got some work to do. Number two, downplaying the positive. Well, you know, um, God is really you're excited. God's really blessed me. and He did this and this and this and listen to this. And they're like, oh, yeah, that was nice. God blessed you. That was good. And you're like, dude, talk about steal my thunder. They're not excited about anything that God does. They're not excited about anything positive. They always want to talk about the negative. Kind of reminds me of the news today, doesn't it? They don't want to talk about anything positive. They want to talk about everything negative and dramatize it. Wrong attitudes. <clears throat> so downplaying the positive. Number three, people who take everything personally. We talked about that. No matter what you say, they take it as an offense. We have a lot of that going on in our nation today. Black lives and all that stuff. 
they take offense. No matter what you say, they're going to twist it and take it the wrong way. Wrong attitude with God. Number four, not having a sense of balance. So they're up one minute, they're down the next minute. They're up one minute, they're down the next minute. It's emotions. Remember what we said, emotions are indicators of what you need to work on and what you need to pray about. God gave you emotions on purpose to use them. <clears throat> Not having a sense of balance. Number five, we talked about this, jumping to conclusions. So <clears throat> no matter what you say, they're in their mind. You're talking to somebody, and you're telling them something, and all the time you're talking to them, they're formulating something as a conclusion in their head. It's called judging. It goes along with judging. They're forming a conclusion before they know the facts. Amen? Number six, believing and acting on our senses rather than God's word. And this one I could take with, um, we could, for an example, we could use healing. A lot of people struggle in this area. We look at our symptoms in our body, which can be just screaming, but the Word of God can tell you, hey, look, by my stripes, you are, you are healed. I sent my Word and healed you and delivered you from your destruction. But your senses and your body can tell you a whole different story, can't they? And so a lot of times we struggle in that area, believing and acting on our senses rather than on God's Word, and that takes a lot of getting into the Word of God and renewing your mind. That's just one example. You can do that in any area with finances. You can look at your bills and, it, and think, God, I don't know. I'm tithing. I'm giving. Come on, help me. You know, and, and the devil will tell you the whole time, you're going down. It's over. You're done. You can't pay that bill. You're going bankrupt. And you're tithing and believing God. You, see, your senses can overwhelm you if you let them. Isn't that right? Amen. So, keep, let's keep moving along. <clears throat> Actions stem from attitudes, and I'm moving along because we're running out of time. Does this go fast or what? It is like flying by. Actions produce results. Faith attitude plus faith actions equals faith results. And this this is huge. Pastor Dave said this, thoughts produce a lifestyle. How many of you guys know that that's true? Your thoughts produce your lifestyle and what you do. So what you think about and what you spend your time on produces in the future what you have been thinking about. And I can use this as writing a song. I can wake up in the middle of the night, and I can use this because this is how my brain works, and I can hear things. So I'm having thoughts I can hear. And I come over here and I put action to my thoughts and I create and produce something, a song. It works the same way in every area of your life. Amen? <clears throat> thoughts produce a lifestyle. Success is born in a renewed mind. So if you want to be in the blessed place, you have to renew your mind with the Word of God every day. And you know what I found? If I could get up in the morning, the morning is the right time because you're putting God first. And there's something about the morning, it's like the, it sets your tone for your day. And the Lord will talk to me more in the morning than He does any other time of the day. In the morning is when, when to do it. I don't care if you have five minutes, ten minutes, put God first in the morning. And that sets the tone for your day. Amen? Success in your calling is relative to your attitude. Success in your calling is relative to your attitude. It's the little things like attitude. It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that determines your altitude. He's just, he's just going over it one more time. Let's flip to the last page because we only have five minutes left about this a minute. I don't think there's any way you could talk about all this in 45 minutes. It's just a tremendous amount of information. But dangers to your mind. There, there is a couple here I wanted to hit real quick. Number one, hypnotism. 
I've never been hypnotized and I never want to be, but Pastor Dave talks about hypnotism and what happens is it loosens the, the, the connection and the wire in your mind. And it opens you up for other things to come in and visit you. And so when you, it, when you dabble in that stuff, you're opening up the door and you're saying, hey, devil, come on in. Hypnotism. So number one is hypnotism. And for lack of time, I'm going to move on. Number two, drugs, which is very similar. When you take drugs, it alters your state of consciousness. And what that does is it can open you up to the spiritual realm. And a lot of people take drugs because they want to be opened up. They think it's cool, man, I got a high. They're going to open you up to the spiritual realm. But what that does, when you're opened up, you can see things and experience things you might not have wanted to see and experience. I know of one girl a couple years ago, she had never taken drugs before, and she took acid. I think it was acid. She took it and waited 15 minutes, never taken drugs. And then I, it didn't work. She said, well, it's not working. I'm going to take another hit. Never taken drugs before. Well, she took another hit, and then all of the sudden, she said the spiritual world opened up to her, and she saw things that scared her so bad, she did not turn the lights off in her house and sleep. She had to sleep with the TV on and the lights on for a year solid. It scared the toenails off of her. You know what I think? I think she saw probably um, demonic beings. And they came in and tortured her, and it took her a year to get herself straightened out. So drugs alter your consciousness. Don't mess with those. Okay? Number two is drugs. Number three, lack of proper rest. How many of you guys have ever had that? <laughs> lack of proper rest. Pastor Dave tells a story in here about a lady who had just had a baby. I don't know if you read this story, but it was pretty funny. She didn't sleep for five days solid. Have you heard this story? So he said, five days solid. This woman didn't sleep. And he said, her husband called me and said, you got to come over here. My wife's nuts. She's saying, you know, I am Lucifer and I'm going to kill you and this, that, and the other. And he's like, my wife is crazy. He said, so Pastor Dave came over there and he said, you know, I went in there and I, I talked to her and read her the scriptures and she calmed down. And he said, I happened to ask, has she slept at all? And he said, oh, no, she hasn't slept in five days. Pastor Dave said, put her to bed. He said they put her to bed and she woke up fine. She just had lack of rest. But see, when you get that tired and that delirious, you can open up your mind to things that shouldn't be in there. Amen. That doesn't mean she had a devil. She just opened her mind up to things because she didn't have enough rest in her body. Number four, occultism. Dabbling in things you shouldn't. Opening yourselves up and, and doing things. You know, we, we did in worship class, I share with you that I wrote a covenant between me and the Lord. And you know, they do that in other religions, and it's not a covenant between the Lord and them. It's, it's the devil. And uh, you can open up doors that way, and you give him free access when you dabble in that stuff. Because you open that door and say, hey, devil, come on in. But I want to open up the, the door to the Holy Ghost and say, hey, Holy Ghost, come on in. Amen? Let's keep moving on. Number five, negative self-talk. This is big um, in the church. Negative self-talk. I've heard so many people down themselves. I'm not worth anything. I can't do anything. I'm so stupid. I can't get anything right. Negative self-talk. And you know what happens when you do that? Your, bo your, your body responds to your voice more than anybody else's voice. And it just believes it. So your body will respond to your voice. And if you say it long enough, guess what? You won't do well. You won't be able to do anything right. Amen? Your words have tremendous power. And when you say them out of your own mouth, your body hears them and responds. So here's what I say. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I renew my mind. Greater is he than he that is in the world. Amen? You just keep repeating those scriptures. Your sound releases power into the atmosphere. 
We talked about that in worship school, didn't we? Your sound releases power into the atmosphere. So negative self-talk. And number six is some secular music. And this is true. And in my mind, my mind works with music. And so I can go to a store and I can hear a song I have never heard. I can hear it one time. And it's like I can memorize that song. And I go home and I can sing you the whole song. Always. That's how powerful music is. So see, music will change the atmosphere, good or bad. Music will bring the presence of God, or it will bring the presence of the devil, good or bad. But see, what you're pumping into your atmosphere is vital to your success or your failure. Isn't that the truth? Secular music is huge. So what, I, so what I do is I try to ju- I pump nothing but godly music. I, sometimes I won't even listen to 881 because sometimes they have, you know, there's other radio stations. You think, well, I don't know. God, I just, I just like to come over and worship the Lord. I love worship music. Anything with Scripture. Most of what we sing here is Scripture. You know why? Because it's the Word of God. And the word of God is power. And if you'll notice, when we sing scripture songs, scripture, say that fast five times, songs here, I'll give you an example, the blessing. That's scripture. Do you feel the presence of God surge the atmosphere when you sing that song? Why? It's the word of God. Your body responds to sound. You're made of it. So what you put in your house and what you listen to in your car has direct effect on your brain and your mind. So why don't you do yourself a favor and renew it with the Word of God? Amen? Did I make it? Did I make it? I made it. (laughs) Oh, did you guys get anything out of that tonight? It's 8.15. We're right on time. Praise the Lord. If you want to study this out more, I encourage you to go back in and read those chapters because there's a lot more in there that I didn't even touch that Pastor Dave talks about, and it's awesome. Amen? So let's pray. Father, Lord, I just thank you for this time that we could come here and and learn about you and worship you. Father, I pray that everything that we have talked about tonight would penetrate each and every person's heart and they would take it home and they would remember it and they would do it, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We make we reach down on the inside of us right now and we change our attitude and we say, God, we're willing and we're obedient. And we're going to eat the good of the land here at the house of prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, I thank you for this tithe. I hold it up before you, and I say, Father, I thank you for blessing this tithe a hundredfold and bless the givers that gave this tithe, Father, in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, I thank you for your protection as we go tonight until we meet again. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen.